All right, so if you'll take your Bibles and go to Romans chapter 2 as we continue in our study through the book of Romans. Uh, this is only our third week into it, so if you're new to our study, you haven't missed too much. And I'll do somewhat of a recap as we head in here to chapter 2. And as I've been saying for the past couple of weeks, uh, before we can get to the good news in Romans, we have to first... Uh, make our way through the bad news. And the bad news that God tells us has to do with the human condition. Uh, God's perspective of the human condition, the way he describes the human condition is very different from the way the world describes the human condition. The basic narrative of the world goes like this. You are basically a good person. And so just continue to be good and be kind and improve your already good condition and be even better and and, and so the story goes, but God's view of the human condition is quite the opposite. That man is not basically good, man is basically bad, and thus mankind needs a savior. That's why God sent Jesus to save us from our bad condition, to rescue us and to forgive us of our sins. But you can't and I can't appreciate and understand our need for Jesus until we first see the bad news. Because since we are sinners, we are subject to, we deserve God's wrath. Now, the word wrath appears more in the book of Romans, at least proportionally, than any other book of the Bible. And so it is an important word we need to understand. And this basic definition is God's righteous anger, his divine indignation, and just punishment in response to human sin. And so we are subject to God's wrath because we are guilty, we are sinners, we're not good people, we're bad people, but God so loved the world that he gave his son Jesus. So that's the good news. But we gotta wade through the bad news. First three chapters of Romans have all the bad news before we can get to chapter four with the good news. And, and in the first couple of chapters, Paul lumps all of us, every human being, into basically three categories that we're calling the unrighteous, the self-righteous, and the over-righteous. But at the same time, Paul also adds that God intentionally has revealed himself to each of these three categories of bad categories of people so that we might see him and know him. And thus, because God has revealed himself to each of these three groups of people, which encompasses the whole human race, we are without excuse. Because if we deny or disobey God, then that's on us because God has revealed himself to us. And how has he revealed himself to us? Well, according to what Paul writes here in chapter one, God revealed himself to the first category, the unrighteous, which is kind of an overall umbrella for all of us, through creation. Back in chapter one, verse 20, it says, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made so that they, us people are without excuse. And so God has revealed himself through creation. If you have any intelligent observation of the universe with all of its complexity and all of its interdependency, you cannot deny the existence of a creator. This didn't just happen accidentally over long periods of time through gradual modification and random successive, you know, modifications. This is the unique handiwork of God and God has displayed himself so that we can't deny his existence. And then last week we talked about, well, what happens to a culture that denies God's existence in creation and starts to worship creation more than creator? And that's last week's Bible study. And it was very similar to reading the, the, the news feed on your iPhone because what Paul describes in Romans chapter one, very similar to the condition of our world today, which because our culture has by and large started worshiping creation more than creator. It's all about going green, the environment, your carbon footprint, and saving the sea turtles and the spotted owl. Meanwhile, we kill our babies and we deny God. And so that's the messed up mentality of our culture and so much more that was last week's study. But for today, we're gonna to look at the last two categories, starting with the self-righteous. Let's first pray and then we'll dive into Romans chapter two. Father, we commit now our Bible study to you. We pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts afresh today. Thank you for the privilege of worshiping you freely here in this place. Be glorified now, we ask, and speak to our hearts as only you can. We love you, Lord, and we thank you that you first loved us. In Jesus' name, amen. Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge... For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. 
For you who judge practice the same things. But we know that the judgment of God is according to truth against those who practice such things. And do you think this, O man, you who judge those practicing such things and doing the same, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you despise the riches of His goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? But in accordance with your hardness and your impenitent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath, there's the word, in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each one according to his deeds, eternal life to those who by patient continuance and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality, but to those who are self-seeking, that's the self-righteous, and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation and wrath, tribulation and anguish on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory, honor, and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. For as many as have sinned without law will also perish without law, and as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, circle that word, their conscience also bearing witness and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. All right, let's pause there for a moment. That's a mouthful, isn't it? Uh, I don't know if you followed along with all of that, but let me help break it down so we can try to understand what he's saying here. Paul starts out in verse 1 by talking about those people who are judgmental. They're just going around scrutinizing everybody else, and they're able to see the sins and faults of everybody else, just not their own. That's why we're calling them here the self-righteous, because they think they are the standard by which to judge everyone else around them, which is not only being judgmental, it's also being hypocritical. Paul points out, because they have faults too, they just can't see their own faults because they're too busy looking at yours. That's the self-righteous. Now, I, I'm sure there's nobody here that fits into that category, but I'm sure you know a person or two. They can spot everybody else's faults, sins, and problems, but not their own. That's the self-righteous. But Paul says here in verse 1, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are, who judge, for in whatever way you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. They just don't recognize it because they're too busy evaluating the sins of other people. Paul says, but you're guilty because you're breaking the same uh, laws of God, whether you know it or not. And the illusion that this creates in the heart of an individual who thinks that he or she is better than other people is this false narrative that they're not accountable to anybody or anything. Because after all, what, me? I don't have any problems, it's everybody else. And so the self-righteous person doesn't realize that he or she is accountable because he or she thinks that he or she is better than everybody else. What, I, I don't need to be accountable to anybody. What, what sin have I committed? Everybody else is the sinner, not me. And this kind of self-righteous thinking crept into the minds and hearts of Gentiles and sometimes Paul uses the word Greek, and Greek and Gentile can be interchangeable in this text, the self-righteous thinking crept into the minds and hearts of Gentiles who didn't know the commandments of God. So they became a law unto themselves. They didn't have the Jewish commandments. Gentiles became a law to themselves, and they judged and evaluated everything and everybody else by their own standard. And, and Paul is saying to us through this passage here to these self-righteous people, by the way, you're not the standard, God is. God is. And so he asks in verse 3 this rhetorical question, he says, do you think you will escape the judgment of God? 
Do you, do you think just because in your own estimation you're a pretty righteous person in comparison to all the other people around you that you think are not as righteous as you, do you think that gets you off the hook? Like somehow you, you're good to go and, and you're not guilty? And he, and he says, no, because God is the standard, not you. And, and Paul anticipates that the Gentiles will have an excuse. So, so right out of the gate, he, he says there in verse one, you're inexcusable, and let me tell you why. And here's the, the excuse that he anticipates that Gentiles will come up with. And they will say, well, we didn't know any better because we're not Jews and we didn't have the law of God, so we don't know the rules. And so why are we guilty if we don't know the rules? By the way, side note, did you know that in a court of law, talking about like in today's uh, system of uh, the legal system, ignorance is not a defense. Ignorance is never a defense. You can't go into a court of law, you've been charged with some kind of a crime, and you cannot say, well, I didn't know. And the judge is going to go, oh, well, because you didn't know, you're good to go. No, the, what they're going to say to you is, you knew, and you're just denying it, you're lying, or should have known. You knew, or should have known. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I had uh, um, a car that, that we own sitting on the street in front of my house here in, in town, and uh, wake up one morning, there's a ticket on the windshield. There's a ticket on the windshield. Now, what's the ticket for? Oh, the ticket was because I had an expired inspection sticker. Now, I thought, I thought, as long as I'm not driving it, okay, it's okay to have it parked there. <laughs> News bulletin. I couldn't claim ignorance. I actually go down into Leesburg PD. I'm like, hey, what's the deal? I got a ticket here. I wasn't driving my car. It's just parked in the street. Yeah, well, you can move it into your driveway, but as long as it's sitting on the street, whether you drive it or not, you're going to get a ticket with an expired inspection sticker. I don't know if this is going to help anybody today. I'm here to help set you free. <laughs> it's $40 I had to pay for your benefit, ladies and gentlemen. And I couldn't go in there and say, well, I didn't know. I mean, that's the truth. I didn't know. They didn't care. They're like, $40, pay up. Don't you know who I am? No, I didn't say that at all. I, in fact, I was a little embarrassed. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, you're the pastor here in town. You should know better. So I yeah, had a ball cap on and sunglasses when I went in. But I couldn't claim ignorance. I couldn't be like, I didn't know. Well, now I know, but you still have to pay. So ignorance is never a defense. And so Paul anticipates the Gentiles are going to be like, hey, you, you think you didn't know because you don't have the rules of God. Sorry, still guilty. Now, for those of you who are new to the Bible, let me just explain a little bit about Gentiles versus Jews. Because in the Bible, God delineates between two groups of people, the entire world's population, delineated into two groups of people. The one group are the people through whom the promise and the person of the Messiah came. That's Jesus, okay? And that people group are the Jews. God selected a people group through whom the promise and person of Messiah should come for the whole world. So those are the Jews, that people group. And everybody else in the world is a Gentile. That's the way you need to understand your Bible. There are Jews and there are Gentiles. And everybody else who's not Jewish is a Gentile. And again, sometimes Paul will use the term Greek because that was the modern population of the day just talking about non-Jews. So you're either Jewish or non-Jewish. If you're non-Jewish, you're basically a Gentile. And the one major difference between Jew and Gentile in the context of this study is that the Jews had the commandments of God. They had the law. They had the ordinances. They knew the standard. Gentiles didn't. By and large, they were unfamiliar. What do you mean 10 commandments? And how many more commandments are there? And so because they didn't have the rules, Paul says, you're still guilty. You can't claim ignorance. And why is he saying that they're still guilty? Well, because of, I had you circle the word when we were reading through it, for you note takers, conscience. Conscience. Because God has given you a conscience that bears witness of his existence. You know what is right and what is wrong because God has given you a conscience. Look here again at verses 14 and 15. Verse 14, for when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, in other words, e even though they don't have the rules, instinctively, they know right from wrong. They show that they understand the rules even though they don't have the rules. 
even though not having the law, they are a law to themselves. Verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience, also bearing witness, and between themselves, their thoughts accusing or excusing them. In other words, he's saying our conscience is either going to bear witness, we're doing a good thing, or we're going to get convicted that we're not doing the right thing. And where does that conscience come from? It comes from God. So you may not have the rules that God has given, but you have a conscience that God has given you, and that testifies of his existence. You know when you're doing something right and when you're doing something wrong, because God, God's given a conscience as a moral compass to steer us and to guide us to bear witness of what is right and what is wrong. And that's the basic definition of a conscience. It's a moral compass. It's an internal mechanism given by God that recognizes right and wrong, good and evil, and the feelings associated with it. When we do right, there is pleasure. When we do wrong, we feel guilt. And that God-given conscience testifies of God himself. Conscience is that inner judge or witness that approves when we do right and disapproves when we do wrong. And God created every human being with this moral capacity. We were knit together in our mother's womb with a God-given conscience to be able to distinguish right from wrong. Now, in psychological terms, someone who has a broken conscience, and there's a whole history behind why people sometimes go through different traumas or different things that break their conscience, those, are, those folks are known as sociopaths. But everyone is given a conscience. And unfortunately, tragically, sometimes a very small minority of people ha have that conscience broken. But, but by and large, listen, you don't need to be a Christian to know right from wrong. God has given everyone because we're created in his image and likeness, the moral capacity to distinguish between right and wrong and good and evil. Nobody has to give you a course, you, you know, instantly. With kids, when you raise kids, you know, when, you know, like they're coloring on the wall and, you know, with a crayon, and then you walk in, they instantly go like, ooh, like, like something triggers, right? <laughs> and you didn't have to sit them down and, and give them a lesson about everything in life to feel guilty about. They just instantly, you know, I was reading uh, uh, when I was putting Tyler to bed when he was little and reading through a book and I came across one of the pages and I had scribbling with a magic marker all over the pages. And I said, hmm, and he was the oldest and the only kid at the, to at the time. And I said, oh, who did this? And he looked right at me, didn't miss a beat. And he said, mommy did that. <laughs> Because he felt guilty, and, and I didn't have to, you know, all I said was, oh, who did this? Mommy did that. He's throwing mommy under the bus. He's like, three. <laughs> His conscience was broken in that moment. <laughs> but nobody has to teach you because, you know, we have this God-given capacity. Let's, let's say you're walking, you're walking down the street in, in downtown D.C. or in Georgetown. There's a lot of tra traffic on the sidewalk, people bustling on the sidewalk. And, and, and some man in front of you gets... gets uh, uh, bumps into another person walking the opposite direction, you see the, the guy's wallet flip out of his, out of his uh, uh, back hip pocket onto the ground. And, um, and you're walking and you see it and so you pick it up. And now at that moment, your conscience kicks in. And, and at that moment, you know, what you should be doing if you have a good conscience is, sir, sir, I don't think you're aware you, you dropped your wallet. But in that moment, your conscience is wrestling, isn't it? Because you're like, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. In a nanosecond, you're thinking all of this. You're thinking all of this. In a nanosecond, you're like, well, wait a minute. I wonder how much money's in this wallet. I'm a little low on cash, and the rent's due this week, and I am a Christian, and maybe this is God's way of providing for me. <laughs> Jehovah Jireh, my provider. You know, and so in a nanosecond, you're going all of this. And you're like, oh, no, 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 no. This isn't right. Like, sir, 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 you, you, you dropped your wallet. I don't think you know. And so I didn't want to be stealing money out of your pocket. And that's what the government does. So I don't need to do that. <laughs> that's a good conscience. Nobody had to give you a lesson on that. That's just your conscience kicks in because it's a God-given thing. But listen, it testifies of God. So the idea is that just as conscience, or rather just as creation testifies of God's existence, so does conscience. And therefore, because God exists, the only reason we know right from wrong is because we've been given from a higher moral authority an understanding of right and wrong. And to deny him and to disobey him means we're guilty. And so Paul says, even though you don't have the law, 
Even though you Gentiles are not Jewish with the law of God, you're still guilty because you go against your conscience, don't you? But then this last category does have to do with the Jewish people. And in this context, we're going to refer to them as the over-righteous because they pride themselves on having the law of God. We have the oracles of God. God has spoken to us. We have the commandments. We know the rules. Yeah? Well, are you living by them? That's what Paul's going to say. Because aren't you more accountable since you actually have those rules? If you break them, what's your excuse? So read on with me, chapter 2, verse 17. Verse 17, he says, Indeed, you are called a Jew and rest on the law and make your boast in God and know his will and approve the things that are excellent, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, having the form of knowledge and truth in the law. So he's like, you know, he's got a little sarcastic here. He's like, oh, don't you think you're wonderful with all these things? He says, verse 21, you therefore who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that a man should not steal, do you steal? You who say, do not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who make your boast in the law, do you dishonor God through the breaking of the law? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, as it is written. And so Paul makes a case here, he says, listen, and you will hear this phrase throughout the Gospels, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. And so sometimes we can read that and think, why are they so privileged? Well, the Jewish people were selected by God, as I said, through whom the promise and person of Messiah should come. That, that makes them, in that sense, privileged, even though Messiah came for everybody, But I want you to understand that as much as you read in the Bible, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile, it's not only in terms of privilege, it's also in terms of penalty. Because if you read back a a moment ago with me in in chapter 2, verse 9, Paul said, tribulation, anguish on every soul of man who does evil of the Jew first and also the Greek. So, first in privilege, but first in penalty. And why? Because if you have the privilege of having the commandments of God and the promise of the Messiah through your people to the whole world, then you are most accountable. Nobody gets a free pass. Not Gentile, not Jew. All of us come to the same height at the foot of the cross. All of us are in need of a Savior whose name is Jesus. And so Paul's argument here is whether you are broadly the unrighteous or whether you are the self-righteous, the, the, the self-righteous Gentiles or whether you are the over-righteous Jews because you have the law and you pride yourself on the law, every human being is guilty. We're all lawbreakers. We all go against our God-given conscience. We all deny God and disobey God. That's the bad news. But now a glimpse of the good news. I'll just read this part, and then we'll save the rest for next week. But if you'll jump to chapter 3 with me, go to chapter 3. Here's a glimpse of the good news, and I want to end with this. Verse 9. So he he summarizes all of this now that we've just read in the first two chapters. And in chapter 3, verse 9, he says, What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks or Gentiles that they are all under sin. All of us. As it is written, verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. You hear that? I don't care how good the world tells us we are. God says we're not. That's why we need a Savior. There's none righteous, no, not one. Verse 11, there is none who understands, there is none who seeks after God. You say, well, wait a minute, Pastor G, I sought after God. No, you didn't. God sought you. You responded to God. Nobody seeks God. God sought after you. You responded. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. Those, uh, rather, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes." 
That's the indictment on the human race. And he goes on to say, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Okay, check that out. One of the reasons why God has given us the law is so that we understand what sin is. Without the law, we wouldn't know our sinful condition. I've used this analogy before, but it's much like a thermometer. When, when you are sick, you use a thermometer that exposes you have a fever. The thermometer can't make you well. It just exposes that you're sick. That's the law of God. Obeying the law can't make us well because we have a sin problem, but it exposes our need for the Savior because it shows how sick we are. And then finally, verses 21 to 24, or verses 21 to 26, he writes, but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets. In other words, the Old Testament foretold the Savior. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely. Now here's where he changes tone to the good news, but being justified freely by his what? Grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness, because in his forbearance and God's patience, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. And the tone changes, and now we finally can head into the, some good news, and we'll pick it up there next week. So let's pause there and pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word. And thank you for the sober reality that you tell us in your word about our own broken, sinful human condition. But like a doctor who tells us bad news, oh, how sweet is the cure. And so, Lord, we look forward to reading more in Romans now that we've understood just our own sinful, depraved condition, how sweet is the cure that we find in Jesus, your grace, your mercy. So Lord, as we gather again together next week, prepare our hearts now to hear the good news. And we give you praise and we give you glory, we give you thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.